welcome back to the session of ICDRI 21 from a very, very interesting discussion on innovations and emerging technologies. Now let us move to a related session that is on digital infrastructure resilience. Now as I said earlier that digital infrastructure is perhaps one of the key infrastructure systems which has enabled us during the last one year to, uh, to work to some extent even despite of COVID-19 pandemic. We were able to talk with our colleagues, hold meetings and make turn our homes into offices due to the video conferencing platforms. The present and future predictions about digital infrastructure show that the need for digital infrastructure will, will rise exponentially and not linearly. It will become and perhaps has already become a lifeline infrastructure system and all other infrastructure systems may depend to some extent on its resilience. Resilience of digital infrastructure is not limited to high technology companies or high technology industries. People in the remotest areas are dependent on resilience of digital infrastructure systems, on mobile networks for their communication needs, for their life livelihoods and disruptions of mobile communication coverage during or after the disasters lead to loss of livelihoods, loss of communication and it, it impacts daily lives of people. During the session, we will have a keynote address from Honorable Minister of Government of India, Mr. Ravi Shankar Prasad, who handles the communication, electronics and information technology portfolio in addition to law and justice for Government of India. We will also have other experts. Now I will like to hand over the session to the session moderator, Mr. Abhilash Panda. Mr. Panda is the head of infrastructure resilience in the United Nations Office for Disaster Risk Reduction. Mr. Panda heads, is the deputy chief for intergovernmental processes, partnerships and heads, head of infrastructure resilience. He has worked extensively in resilience issues and he has authored many publications and peer reviewed articles. Abhilash also serves at the board of two ISO committees and in the committee of international journal of disaster resilience in the built environment. So without further ado, now I hand over the session to Mr. Abhilash Ponda. Over to you Abhilash. Thank you very much Sandeep uh, for the introduction. I'm very pleased to be invited as the moderator to this very important and I would say very urgent session. Now, as you rightly said, uh, technology is all around us. The digital transformation we have seen over the last few years has increased the emphasis on being always online. Now take India for an example. In 2015, India had roughly 7.5% of its population connected to the internet. By 2019, this percentage has increased to 34. Now, Indian mobile data users consume roughly 8.3 gigabytes of data each month on average. In fact, India is digitizing faster than any other country. This is, could be also said for a lot of other emerging economies and the markets. Now, on one side, the digital transformation that we are seeing has opened doors to elevate poverty, create opportunities, monitor and improve emergency response, but this has also added a new layer of vulnerability. A single disaster caused by natural or man-made hazard could lead to serious damages to the critical information systems and trigger the failure of the whole networks. The title of this session very aptly resonates with the status of developing resilience policies and practices. We are indeed at the exploration phase, but the fast digitization of the world spurred by the sudden challenges of life and businesses under COVID-19 means that we need to significantly increase our engagement and efforts. As you rightly said, Sandeep, today we have a diverse panel of experts and specialists from various sectors. 
with whom we will discuss this perspective and their opinions on some of the challenges and solutions. But before starting our discussion with the panel, I would like to give the floor to Honorable Minister for Communications, Electronics and Information Technology, Law and Justice for Government of India, Mr. Sri Ravi Shankar Prasad for his opening remarks. Your Excellency, the digital floor is yours. Distinguished members of the panel, it is indeed a matter of privilege for me to address International Conference on Disaster Resilient Infrastructure. We are indeed living in very challenging times. COVID is still to leave us. It keeps on coming with alarming reg uh, regularity, creating problem for large number of human beings, deeply stressing the supply infrastructure of government, including vaccine and other preemptive steps to prevent it. I'm very happy to note that this particular conference is going to really stress upon digital resilient infrastructure. In particular, I would like to share with all of you our own experience in India and how our Digital India program rose to great heights in mitigating the suffering of 1.3 billion plus people of India during the challenging times of COVID. When our Prime Minister Narendra Modi was campaigning in the year 2014 to be the leader of India, which is subsequently won twice with massive majority, he coined an expression that if people of India elect me, I'll try to create an India where IT plus IT is equal to IT, which means India's talent, IT, plus information technology, IT, is equal to India tomorrow, IT. And digital India is basically the overpowering theme to concretize that narrative. What is Digital India? Digital India simply means empowering ordinary Indians with the power of technology, bridging the digital divide, and most important, bring in digital inclusion. And this must be acquired through technology, which is homegrown, developmental, and low cost. With this narrative of Digital India, we sought to empower ordinary Indians. Certain statistics about India need to be noted. India's population, 1.35 billion plus. India is home to nearly 1.18 billion mobile phones, out of which 1.16 billion plus are smartphones. Close to 750 million are smartphones. Now, with this, uh, nearly 1.26 billion is Aadhaar digital identity to supplement the physical identity. And how we concretize this arrangement into a reality of empowering the common people. Just to give an example, we opened nearly for 20 million bank accounts the poor who had no access to bank accounts. Link that with the digital identity Aadhaar. And we started sending all the welfare measure to the poor people in the bank account, the gas subsidy or ration subsidy or other welfare measures. And we have sent about $193 billion, uh, $195 billion directly into the bank account, which is known as DBT, Direct Benefit and we have saved close to 25 billion US dollars, which is to be pocketed by middlemen and fictitious claimants. Based upon this success, e-scholarship, e-visa, creating a digital marketplace for farmers to supply their uh, farm produce. Uh, then a public platform for procurement of goods, 
uh, e-hospital, e-health, all this really was very challenging in transforming India because the wide network of mobile phone, nearly 95% coverage, people could really exploit it properly. And as our Prime Minister said, we will be very keen to ensure that governance must be available in the palm of every Indian. We also in accelerated uh, mobile manufacturing in a very big way. From just two mobile factories in the year 2014, India is now home to nearly 260 plus mobile manufacturing factories in the world. We are the second biggest country in terms of mobile manufacturing and other ecosystem. Now we have come with a new program of production link incentive, namely come set up your factory, manufacture, export outside or use the domestic market and earn your incentive. India is also one of the largest country in terms of app economy, in terms of uh, use of social media, almost close to one three point billion plus uh, social media users are there on various platforms. All this was available. Then came this tragedy of COVID. Now, the first thing we did was that in COVID, we uh, ensured that this direct benefit transfer continues uninterrupted. And we have <coughs> sent billions of rupees into the bank of the poor, including by the postal department, the entitlement of women, 500 rupees every month. Then our farmers, close to, I would say, almost 100 million farmers getting bank account into their, getting their 6,000 rupees every year into the bank account, again by DBT. Therefore, this direct benefit transfer instrument continued uninterrupted even during COVID. India, ladies and gentlemen, as you all are aware, is a big center of IT operations. How to continue work during challenging times when there was no rail, there was no air movement, there was no highway movement. Then India's mobile, landline, IT, postal operations came in very, very handy. I would like to just tell you. We develop a very unique India product, Aragya Setu IVRS system. Contract tracing. In the event you are coming in contact with someone who has been afflicted, you please be on the guard. And nearly 200 million plus Indians have submitted their self-assessment to this IVRS system known as uh, Aragya Setu. To help Indian IT operations work, we liberalized the entire regime and work from home became a norm where India's IT backup system, other operations could work from home, including international companies. And now we have ensured maturing of work from home to work from anywhere. This model has become very, very popular. Then <clears throat> COVID Southern system. What was COVID Southern system? We created a platform which is capable of sending targeted messages to millions of people who were in different quarantine centers of the country as to how they must behave, what caution, uh, precautions they need to take, and a variety of other aspects we encourage. It was important that the ecosystem of payment should continue. Uh, therefore, uh, when there was no ATM, there was no bank, uh, our government ensured through the postal operations of the postman to reach the far-flung villages of India and disburse money to the Aadhaar-enabled fingerprint system where you could be delivered the cash in a defined uh, quantity uh, so that you're, you can continue with your life even during these challenging times. This Bhim UPI payment the transaction stood at 19.96 billion transactions from April 2020 to March 2021. Uh, you know, India is governed by rule of law. 
we ensured that there is no interruption of that as well, be the Supreme Court or the High Court or the subordinate court, they all together had a hearing of nearly 7 million cases in a virtual form. The entire education also ran digitally in a virtual form. <clears throat> the point I'm trying to highlight is, even during this disaster of COVID, our digital India ecosystem came in handy in a very, very big way. Uh, we have uh, also ensured digital technology for uh, uh, people to get their vaccine, the co-vaccine or the COVID shield, as the case may be. Uh, India has done it exceedingly well, including sending it to more than 70 countries globally. It has also become a big movement. If I just to concretize how the entire digital ecosystem has been able to help us uh, improve the lives, give succor, and not to cause big interruption during the most challenging times which the humanity has seen recently, that is COVID challenge. We could overcome that only and only because of this digital ecosystem which we have created. And our focus on digital inclusion, bridging the digital divide, has given us a lot of benefit. Uh, I can tell you, I just talked about Aadhaar. Aadhaar is again a technology made in India. There is one Ayushman Bharat. What is Ayushman Bharat? We give half a million rupee every year, five lakh rupees, to millions of Indians who registered by the government support. Again, Ayushman Bharat is being done digitally. I talked about GSTM, the General Sales Tax Recovery, again is done digitally. I've already talked about e Mandi, where farmers can sell their produce. Ladies and gentlemen, all these infrastructure, digital infrastructure, with inclusion as the focus of our approach, really gave us a lot of help during these challenging times of COVID. Now, I have shared my, our, our in India's experience. My suggestions for the distinguished panel is that there, there need to be a global consensus on the, uh, on the application and use of digital technology to mitigate the suffering arising out of disaster. In an experiment, surely can be of great help. Yes, the civil society <coughs> and the world has to rise in one, rise in one voice to ensure that digital infrastructure must be safe. Digital infrastructure must be secure from hackers, from terrorists, and others who try to disrupt so that people continue to suffer. The whole world needs to have a stake in the safety and security of this new invention, which we call internet. In India, we have taken a position very clearly that the internet is one of the finest creations of human mind, but it should not remain the monopoly of few. It must be used for the welfare of the entire human kind. And therefore, we always say that if internet is a global phenomenon, it must have linkage with the local, local ideas, local culture. And in India, we have used internet basically to those objective which we seek to which we seek to fulfill to ensure inclusive development of ordinary Indian. And we in India have close to 700 million internet penetration rising every month, every week. Our Prime Minister has said that we have got 600,000 villages of the country. We need to reach by the Internet Bharat Net project infrastructure in the coming 1,000 days, which are working together. Once that ecosystem becomes available down to the remotest part of the country, I hope 
that the success of Digital India is going to give us further strong foundations to respond to any challenges which may arise from any disaster. I think what the government of India has done, it surely is something to be believed. We produce highest number of data and the data usage has also increased 137 times from 89.4 megabytes per subscriber per month to 12.1 gigabyte per subscriber per month. Even the broadband mission is taking on greater speed to ensure broadband availability in every nook and corner of the country. Why India is important in disaster management and mitigation? India is important because of its size. India is important because of the weight of population. India is important because of its diversity. And most important, all these challenges have to be have to be addressed within the parameters of a democratic society and democratic governance. And here, I would like to commend the stellar role of our Prime Minister, Narendra Modi, during most challenging times, he ensured that while he upholds the democratic value of consulting with all the states, the chief ministers, having proper distancing, uh, ensuring innovative products in the field of vaccine. But what is important is the relief must reach to every nook and corner of the country. And during these challenging times of pandemic disaster, our digital ecosystem was of great help. I thought I must share with you, maybe India's experience is something to be considered. With these words, my greetings, thanks once again for giving me this forum to address an issue of similar importance. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Excellency, um, your opening remarks and also for bringing for a number of key points. The first one being that, that digital infrastructure has now become the cornerstone to bridge the di digital divide. The efforts of government of India are exemplary. In fact, you have coined a new term, uh, working from anywhere. You also raise the need of good governance, which is indeed critical for all aspects of risk management. Um, as Your Excellency noted, currently we have a limited knowledge and understanding of complex and cascading risks that threaten digital infrastructure and the connected services. Um, in fact, in 2019, a cyclone Fani that struck the coastal state of Odisha in India ripped apart the telecom infrastructure with direct losses amounting to more than $70 million um, in losses. Another dimension of network services is, is the example from March 2015 in Amsterdam and the surrounding region suffered an out power outage that lasted more than five hours. The outage was caused by a technical fault at a network substation and a third dimension is linked to the Malaysia cyber threats. So um, from hearing uh, His Excellency, how do we address the challenges we already know about and those we still do not know? As the Honorable Minister mentioned in his remarks, integrating resilience measures in regulatory processes and frameworks is one of the key actions that we need. And that's what good governance is all about. Now, before I give the floor to the panel, I would also like to mention that the COVID-19 pandemic has also pointed out how critical it is that digital infrastructure is not only resilient, but also equitable. Now, the digital divide has led to limited access to healthcare services to vulnerable groups across the globe. We just have 10 years left to deliver on the hopes and aspirations raised by the adoption of the Sendai framework, the Sustainable Development Goals, and the Paris Agreement. Now, with trillions of dollars ready to be injected or already being put forward uh, for the recovery from COVID-19, now is the right time for governments and private sector and all other stakeholders to consider how best these investments can be resilient green and equitable. In our rush to recover from COVID-19, we must not miss a golden opportunity to reduce existing level of risk and avoid create, creating new risks. Now, sustainability and resilience are two sides of the same coin. Unsustainable infrastructure, whether digital or otherwise, undermines the resilience of those who are dependent on its smooth functioning. I hope 
today. Uh, we would gain some insights from our panel members and also hear a bit on um, what are some of the challenges and solutions to this. And now let me uh, introduce the, the very uh, long, good and strong list of experts I have on the panel. Um, first, I have uh, Professor Simon Petro Romano, professor, professor of Computer Networks, University of Napoli. Hello, everybody. He will be joined by Mr. Philip Lorek, advisor to the General Secretary of Ministry of Environment, Government of France. Hello, everyone. He would be joined by Mr. Brad Morel, Senior Advisor and Director of International Engagement for the United States Government's First Net Authority. He will be joined by Ms. Aruna Pitikti, Senior Vice President, Network Operations Head, Bharati Airtel Limited. Good afternoon to all. She would be then joined by Mr. Satoshi Sasakura, Executive Manager, Nippon Telegraph and Telephone Corporation, Network Business Headquarters. And lastly, with Ms. Vanessa Gray, Head of Environment and Emergency Telecommunication Division, Telecommunication Development Bureau, the International Telecommunication Union. Good afternoon. Uh, I have the pleasure of welcoming all my panel members. Uh, with less than 50 minutes, uh, left with us, I would uh, straight away go to the first question, and I will start that with Ms. Gray. Um, so, um, Ms. Gray, what, what role does digital infrastructure resilience play for sustainable development, including the achievement of SDGs and Sendai framework targets? Thank you very much. Um, can you hear me? Very clear. Good. Um, your Excellency, uh, ladies and gentlemen, dear participants, um, when one year ago the WHO declared COVID-19 virus a global pandemic, digital technologies quickly became the new lifeline. The pandemic has demonstrated the essential role of connectivity worldwide and also the importance of having a robust, resilient and secure digital infrastructure in place for coordination mechanisms as well as for social welfare, for the global economy and for sustainable development. And connected communities can help, uh, can access health information, education services, and receive life-saving disaster warnings. They can pay for goods and services and increase their productivity and competitiveness, which we've also obviously had, have heard from the minister um, from India. So for the um, ITU, the UN agency in charge of information and communication technologies, our mandate to connect the world really took on a, a whole new meaning. There are a number of roles that digital infrastructure resilience play for sustainable development. First of all, we realized that digital connectivity is a key determinant of how quickly we are able to recover from this dual health crisis and economic crisis and to reshape our world into some kind of new normal. For many developing countries, especially the least developed countries, this still means developing a sustainable and resilient internet ecosystem that is built on core internet infrastructure. This means core international and national backbone infrastructure, as well as the fundamental components that store and exchange data within a nation, internet exchanges, data centers, and cloud computing and hosting services. So this digital infrastructure will keep traffic local, reduce risks and costs, and help build more internet applications, services, and online content. We have delivered clear evidence of the benefits of broadband for economic recovery and sustainable development in every aspect of the 17 sustainable development goals. This includes studies to show that infrastructure investments can mitigate the negative economic impact of the crisis. And we encourage leaders to make the right investment priorities and fund network modernization and expansion to underserved areas, especially in emerging and developing economies. Another important aspect is the resiliency of networks in terms of its capacity and its safety. Despite huge demand spikes over the last year and some outages and challenges, of course, the world's broadband networks have largely coped well under unprecedented pressure. Reliance on digital tools means greater exposure to cybersecurity risks 
and these threaten the confidentiality, integrity, and availability of ICT infrastructure and services, increasing the level of cyber insecurity. Tech companies, hospitals, government agencies, and others are investing in cybersecurity solutions to protect their business practices and, of course, the millions of customers that trust them with their data. ITU supports these efforts by tracking cybersecurity commitments through its Global Cybersecurity Index and assisting member states with the development of national cybersecurity strategies to manage cyber risks by coordinating actions for prevention, mitigation, response, and incident recovery. We also help countries develop national emergency telecommunication plans. Now, the pandemic has been a disruptive global force, but also an opportunity for us to rethink and build back better. This means investing in digital innovation and designing digital platforms with privacy, safety, and security in mind. More than anything, this will require a whole of government approach built on cross-sectoral cooperation and new and bold partnerships between the public and the private sector. Digital solutions and partnerships will be critical to use this last decade of action to achieve the sustainable development goals. A decade of action to build a better world where digital infrastructure is affordable, reliable, and within reach of every citizen. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Vanessa. Um, you actually highlighted a lot of very um, interesting things. In fact, you all you laid out the bearings on the need of looking after the the most vulnerable, uh, the LDCs, uh, the role of technology in um, addressing resilience. Uh, but also, you indicated this the need of the whole of government approach and the role of PPPs. I think these are these are very strong elements. Uh, looking into the factor, definitely. Now that brings me. Um, taking the PPP factor, but also understanding that a lot of uh, investments in infrastructure comes from the private sector. Um, I'll now move on to uh, Mr. Sasakura. Now, um, Mr. Sasakura, um, what, what according to you uh, are some of the challenges that um, your company or your corporation is facing in planning for and integrating resilience in the digital infrastructure uh, segment? Can you give us an example? Okay. Hello, everyone. I'm Satoshi, Satoshi Sasakura. It is a great honor to be given this opportunity here. To be honest, it is my first time to make a speech in English. It might be a bit hard to hear my English clearly, but I would appreciate your understanding on this matter. Let me introduce myself briefly. I'm from MTT East in Japan. I am an executive manager in the Disaster Countermeasures Office. I have been with this company for more than 20 years and I ex experienced the Great East Japan earthquake as a manager in the Disaster Countermeasures Office in MTT. Today, I'd like to talk about my experience in this disaster and our challenge for the future. To begin with, I'll talk about the lesson of the Great East Japan earthquake. This was a huge damage in telecommunications facilities when the disaster occurred 10 years ago, you know. We received demands of covering telecommunication from many organizations, such as the government, critical infrastructure companies, and other private companies then. In other words, every organization could not use telecommunication. I realized that repairing networks is not only for local people and also for the organization, because Telecommunication is the base of social systems. That makes me think whether we could do to react to recover it in the context of various demands and social situations. Meanwhile, we could cooperate with the government and electric power supply for nuclear accidents in, in Fukushima. 
It was a kind of lesson about the importance of collaboration with other organizations. I think a great challenge is how to collaborate with the local governments and critical infrastructure companies and do triage to recover social situations. NTT East is a designated company by basic law for disaster countermeasures in Japan. That is why we are responsible for contributing to local governments for recovering when disaster happens so. So we have tried to understand the disaster prevention plans of local governments. Furthermore, we are trying to recognize what is required and at what timing by a disaster striking area. For the reason, we coordinate with them even in peacetime and try to be clear of their dependence on disaster countermeasures. First, we start making a structure to communicate with critical companies such as medicine, laws, electric power and transport. For instance, DMAT is a group of the disaster medical systems in Japan. We make sure that use, they use mobile communication line primarily in the disaster medical field. And as another example, one electric power supply company uses private line mainly. The point is you, they use telecommunication differently on their activities. For that reason, we are trying to understand how critical companies and governments use telecommunication. In addition, we need to cooperate with the news media to manage the traffic congestion. The structure of cooperation with various organizations will help people in a disaster striking area, keep their lives and property and also regain their daily life rapidly. Also, we have done hardware countermeasures, for instance, march routes of network, backup power supply. The effect of disaster is wider and it lasts longer and, and more. In conclusion, the most important thing is how to communicate efficiently with critical organizations and governments for disaster prevention and disaster mitigation. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Sasakura-san. Uh, um, those, those challenges are indeed graving in nature. Um, I picked up a few, but I think one, one which, uh, which was a highlight for me is when you mentioned about how to collaborate with local governments. Uh, this is indeed critical in, in, in point that we need to factor in. Uh, maybe we'll we'll get to hear uh, some solutions as we uh, go ahead with uh, our discussions. Uh, so with that, uh, I'll move to my third panel member, uh, Ms. Aruna Pidipi from Air, Bharti Airtel. Uh, so Aruna, my question to you would be, what are the vulnerabilities and risks to digital infrastructure that you think are the most prominent in your experience? Okay, so uh, uh, Your Excellency, Mr. Panda, Abhilash Panda and other panel members, thanks for giving me this opportunity to share my experience, especially in this important forum, very relevant uh, forum. As uh, you all heard that Indian infrastructure investment and focus on the digital transformation increased many fold. And we heard many examples of the projects from our Honorable Minister. Penetration of our mobile broadband, especially in the complete, our pan-India network, and the optical connectivities, the, that is the communication among all these things, and also this power supply expansion. And on top of that, with the expansion of our low-cost smartphones, enabled millions of our Indians to connect to the internet, and which enabled us having seamless connectivity to various services. That's how this entire digital transformation happened and which has become the lifeline for all of our human beings, the connectivity. Since this is so important, the connectivity part, we as a telecom service providers or an essential service providers, we need to ensure to have a minimum disruption for the services or the connectivity. 
So in our domain, especially in the telecommunications, what are the various you know, the risks or the vulnerabilities which we foresee as per our experience. So, you know, basically if I speak about in the past, what are the natural disasters impacted us? Like as Mr. Panda also mentioned, funny, we had funny in Orissa, the coastal area, Amphan, the recent, uh, in the current year, Amphan, Nivar, Nisarga. So there are many things. And also, apart from these cyclones, we also see the floods. The, this, these are yearly floods, you know, in some of the areas in India, especially in Bihar, Assam, these kind of locations, where we see the natural disasters are increasing for us year on year. For, ex for If I see the data, we, as per our experience, in, in 2017, we have faced such kind of issues around six numbers. Now the same by 2020, it has become 12. That means on the average, every month we are facing such kind of issues, you know, at any part of the, the country. So thus it is very important for us based on our learnings, which we picked up over several years, we identified what are the risks or what are the mitigations, those things. If I talk about the risks, basically based on these experiences, which I say, where in the complete Indian net, Indian environment, which states we can get cyclones, which states we get the cloud burst, which states we get the heavy rains, where the lightning, or where, where are the areas, the earthquake prone areas, where do we get the floods? So we categorize our all these states and then try to identify what are the risks and what are the vulnerabilities. Mainly if I speak about on the telecommunication domain on the vulnerabilities part, the, we have three, four important broader domains for it. The first domain is the data centers. The data centers, main switching units, which is heart of our total communication network. So the vulnerability comes for those data centers mainly. Where are these buildings located? You know. Suppose if we take the funny as an example, or the, the recent cyclones of Chennai as an example, is this building located near to that particular zone or is it away from that particular cyclone zone? So these are some of the vulnerabilities or the you know uh, important criteria we have to take care when we build these data centers or switching centers. What is the accessibility, approachability of these buildings? And a minute kind of an, an uh, risks which we, which needs to be, be because these are these are based on our experiences you know how that air conditioning units are installed on usually we install on top of the terrace or adjacent to the buildings how these installed that also might might create the problem these are also one of the vulnerabilities risk based on our own experiences which we can so we yeah. have whole list of these you know vulnerabilities which from the data center perspective, what are those? Similarly, if I go towards the consumer, the user side, you know, since uh, it comes to as the towers, towers is mainly the cell sites where most of the coverage or connectivity will come to the users. Where are these towers located? If it is cyclone prone area, what is the strength of these towers? You know, are they vulnerable to the, you know, these wind speeds? Is the strength is capable enough? How is the connectivity part, you know, uh, the connectivity in terms of is it connected on the microwave or is it connected on the fiber? That also matters, you know, because if it is connected on the microwave, maybe the tower strength, you know, the tower load will increase. It may be one of the, the vulnerable or risk. How is the power connectivity in those particular areas, the power availability in those areas? Is the power is going through underground or is the power is going through the normal poles you know we have such kind of infrastructure in many locations this also matters when we talk about the vulnerabilities which again i can tell one of our examples when we seen in funny why it took so many days for us to restore because of the the infrastructure the power infrastructure those things took long time because these are all connected on the poles so that's one of the reasons but there are various Kind of vulnerabilities when we speak about needs to be considered end to end. Apart from this, when I come to the cell side, that is the user part. The third important point is the fiber connectivity. How these buildings are connected? 
how these sites or cell sites are connected from these fiber network. Obviously, whenever we see any natural disaster or anything, you know, the trees get uprooted, there will be huge winds, uh, all those things may cause a lot of disruption to the fiber. That means we will be losing the connectivity. So how do, what are the, you know, risks of these vulnerabilities? Where is this fiber located? Is it connected on underground? Is it connected on aerial? So these are the important vulnerabilities we have to keep having our own database, you know, for the reason-wise, location-wise, which we see these are the main risks on that. Apart okay. from this technical, so one important criteria mainly on the people part. See, one is the natural disasters. The other one is manual errors. These also can cause a disaster for which we also need to have the really the mitigation plans for them. And what are the various challenges or the support in, in these disasters, especially as I mentioned, the infrastructure, the accessibility to the roads, the power supply availability, the fuel availability, there are various things which are really, really matter of considering as a risk or the vulnerability if we see in the current infrastructure. So both as an external and a internal, I try to point out what would be the various you know, risks in the current uh, service telecom industry. Yeah, thank you very much, Aruna, for that. Um, you definitely raised a lot of uh, um, interesting things. You know, the fact that the number of events have uh, basically doubled in three years period, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's already an uh, issue that uh, is putting a lot of investments in infrastructure um, uh, at risk. Um, I definitely would like to go into more uh, to what mentioned, but I have less than 29 minutes now. Um, and I definitely would like to take some questions that are coming in from our audience uh, from the floor. But before that, um, um, I would go to uh, Mr. Morrell. Um, and because I'll be coming back to most of my speakers with additional questions. So, uh, so appreciate if you could uh, uh, keep your responses a bit brief here. Uh, Mr. Morrell, um, with uh, COVID-19, the dependency on the digital infrastructure sector has exponentially increased. Right. So where do you see the vulnerabilities, especially complex and the cascading risks coming in? Sure. I'm happy to talk about that briefly. So I understand FirstNet is the first responder network authority is a nationwide network uh, with dedicated spectrum, wireless broadband spectrum, just to the mission of public safety and the support areas that support that mission. So we're three years into a five-year deployment and build-out of this nationwide network, and it was just in time for COVID and all the exciting times that we've had in the U.S. this past um, year, and it was very helpful. Um, COVID brought a lot of major challenges, and as I heard mentioned before, it was a term we used here, the, the work anywhere concept, that um, you know we're used to the challenges in the evening in the suburbs and the rural areas of our three or four of your kids you know, watching Netflix and YouTube at a time, and now... You added the mom and the dad and the, the parents and the family members and everybody working off of the network and just, just draining that bandwidth. Um, and a lot of times those missions and those needs were very critical to their, their business functions and other areas. In the same time, we had this um, demand of public safety that they have no fail mission critical data and mission critical voice requirements. So we're able to rely on this dedicated spectrum to FirstNet to uh, build up the bandwidth in areas as needed to uh, ensure that they were getting the connections that they needed and also take some of their traffic off of those commercial networks so that the, the public had a little more spectrum to use as well, giving them some more uh, resiliency and reliability. Um, at the same time that this was going on, uh, you, you know, we had the typical day-to-day -day disasters or seasonal disasters such as wildfires in the West, hurricanes in the East, um, as clearly everybody saw, there was a lot of civil unrest and protests and other issues happening throughout cities in the U.S. So we had to be able to find a way to make sure the reliability of the network was there for public safety at all times, um, as well as try and take that, again, that demand off of the commercial networks. We successfully did that in, in multiple areas, um, watching what the requirements were all the time. In many cases, we have a fleet, a large fleet of deployables dedicated to public safety. Kind of as you see in my backdrop, an aerostat that we could put an antenna up 1,500 feet, tie that into a, a sat colt, and you know, 
cover an entire area if it was knocked out um, from a disaster or there was just a sudden need. Some of those sudden needs that were required during COVID, we were standing up uh, testing centers, we're standing up vaccine clinics, standing up treatment centers in stadiums and non-traditional areas that maybe didn't have enough fiber or copper in some of the older cases run to them. So we had to create wireless networks. Uh, we quickly put deployables out there to cover the increased need um, and successfully did that in many areas. So certainly for the demands of public safety, we're able to surge and meet those mission critical requirements. I think that continues to also show that resiliency that those wireless networks bring in the cellular area over some of the traditional LMR or land mobile radio networks that the density of cell coverage. So if we lose one cell, really not a, that devastating because we have multiple other cells that can pick up those coverage areas. Um, and we certainly had success with that and we're able to quickly respond to increase that bandwidth. Um, those are some of the areas, but I think the, the success of trying to stand up all these special um, quick ad hoc needs of COVID and rely on FirstNet to do that, um, found great uh, promise for increasing this uh, demand, uh, a response to the demand. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Morrell. Um, in fact, you know, you already have given us uh, some possible solutions. Uh, that's already a headway into the into what I think we, we, we would try to come out of this discussion as well. And thank you also for being awake uh, so early at your <laughs> end. Uh, and joining us on that. As long as uh, I've got my coffee, I'm good. <laughs> uh, so uh, with that, I'll miss, move to Mr. Lorek um, from the government of France. So Mr. Lorek, uh, the, the one area that I would definitely like to hear from you uh, coming from the, uh, from, from the government is, and this was also reflected a bit by, by some of my earlier, earlier band members on the role of the private sector. Um, do you come across any um, good practices on engaging the private sector and ensuring that the assets and services they provide are uh, resilient? Yeah, thank you for your invitations and uh, your excellencies our speaker. Well, uh, the use of digital technology in infrastructure can be uh, considered in a very simplified view in two ways. Uh, first, better efficiency of services, I will say normal time, and uh, <clears throat> better resilience in case of crisis. Um, for us, digital technology is a risk and an opportunity for the critical infrastructure. Uh, indeed, uh, digital technology uh, is an opportunity to rationalize the criti critical infrastructure's network and to improve efficiency to industrial productions. Although it enables the reinforcement of computer protection means, it increases risk and favors the emergence of new risk. Indeed, it also fosters the emergence of new risk and a more complex applications framework, new type of actors and attack causing a maximum of damage while implementing a minimum of means and with a minimum of for foreign or individual actors. Uh, no, the French systems, we say. Um, France has put in place a governmental framework uh, that extends one for friend, from cyber security, we create a special service named NC, that is at the prime minister level to manage all the um, cyber attack for in the uh, territory. Second, to infrastructure security, we have technical, physical, human, and information system via uh, legal obligations and control processes by public services. And at the end, through the control of foreign investment for the concerned companies. Um, at one point, um, the, the resilience of critical infrastructure I would say in time of the COVID pandemic, uh, during the pandemic, uh, I would say the pandemic uh, COVID was an opportunity to test the effectiveness of public and private resilience policies and strategies. And we, the following tools were implemented. First one, 
we have uh, activity business continuity plans for the different sector of critical infrastructure, strategic infrastructure. And second, we, we have the strategies of social and financial support for main strategic industries in the infrastructure, um, especially, and maintaining vital service and infrastructure in water, energy, waste treatment, etc. Even some employers are sick or confined. And the main conclusion of I would say that this test is that the feedback, the feedback has led to the following conclusions. First, private and public companies in consultation with the state services, each played, I would say, the role. Second, this coordination was inserted within the framework of a crisis structure or cell at the ministerial or prime minister level in the presence of representatives of the companies concerned. Third, we no supply disruptions during the crisis. And but in the end, the COVID pandemic is a major risk that is difficult to manage and its economic and human impact is significant, but it does not uh, have a hybrid character. And the origin and form of the risk are known, even if we not also during the, this period several cyber attacks on hospital structure in France, for example. We have a, you, you know that at the same time, we must manage the pandemic crisis. And in the same time, we, we know that there is some, uh, some uh, cyber attack on the uh, hospital and uh, uh, structures. We must to imagine, for this uh, fact, we must imagine new methodology and digital tools to face this new hybrid risk. Indeed, hybrid risk are a mixture of risk, conventional or unconventional, and of targets, company or states. And they are often used by states or private organizations relying on non-state actors to evade accountability. This, appro this approach is concretized in a new project in, uh, named IPNET and by the writing of two new directives at the European level about critical infrastructure and cybersecurity that for the first time are linked together means that we have two directives linked together about cybersecurity and um, critical infrastructure. And we have an umbrella named IMNET to manage this new kind of risk of hybrid risk. And to conclude, we, uh, there is uh, for us no such things as zero risk. And resilience also requires by the use of new technology, artificial intelligence, blockchain, semantics modeling, by preparing training for crisis management and also by the development of decision support tools. Finally, the use of, the use of digital technology is a permanent adaptation due to the appearance and transformation of increasingly complex risk. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Lorek. Um, you know, you, 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 you raised a uh, very valid point that it's, it's efficiency and resilience. It's the both dimension that comes into play. And I think that's where the private sector also comes in. Um, with that, I'll move to my last panel member, uh, Professor Romano. Now, Professor, we, uh, we have been discussing a lot about what's, what's happening, what is the current state of play, what's, uh, what are the risks and vulnerabilities based on the current infrastructure stock we have on digital uh, in the digital sector. Um, but from a scientific and uh, science perspective, um, in the future, where do you see these vulnerabilities and risks coming in? And especially from a IoT perspective, um, I would request you if you could uh, respond uh, briefly in two minutes. Uh, yeah, yeah, we'll try and, and, and cut down my, my answer time, no worries. So just let me thank you all for inviting me to join such a variegated set of brilliant brains. And I will try and be obviously very brief given the time constraints that we have. But basically, when we talk about the, the Internet of Things, I would say that we basically talk about the increasing convergence of the physical and the digital worlds. 
So we, we have devices that vary from internet connected power generation equipment that has already been mentioned in a previous talk uh, to wearable health trackers and perhaps smart home appliances. So all of these devices can uh, get connected to the internet nowadays. And this, uh, as with all benefits, also uh, brings in uh, some uh, serious risks, I would say. And the impacts of such risks range from, uh, you know, individual computer safety up to national security. And this has already been discussed, uh, fortunately. So obviously cybersecurity is currently a, a relevant concern for uh, even if we just take into account the, the simplest household objects. I mean, you can figure out of events like uh, smart electric kettles that can be remotely set to, to explode. Or even if you just think of your children playing with their toys, there might be people who are going to eavesdrop on private conversations. And this happens just because of the fact that basically we are connecting computing technology to everything and then we are going to connect everything to the internet, which is good, obviously, but this brings in a number of risks and uh, we should think carefully uh, of uh, these. When we connect our stuff to the internet, we should be very, very careful. Uh, obviously, uh, the IoT needs a reliable security throughout its entire ecosystem, I would say. And the issue, the main issue that we see as researchers is that the, the unsecure nature of the devices that make up the billions of nodes that are going to get connected to the internet are the, the major part of the problem. Uh, we currently have many vendors who bring inside the internet ecosystem insecure or poorly configured products. And this is typically due to the fact that there is you know a need for responding to competitive pressures coming from the market and there is also a lack of a, a clear and i would say a a, a secure uh, set of development standards so i will really keep this short but basically i would also say that if we look at what is happening inside the regulation system there are a variety of policies and a, a number of best practices that have been proposed, but we still witness uh, a, a lack of adoption of such practices. And basically everything stays voluntary. And uh, up until now, I have to say uh, from my perspective that there is uh, really, we, we have failed to, to stem, let me say, to stem the tide of the unsecure uh, IoT. So uh, this is a, an issue we still have to face. Thank you very I much, Professor. Muted. Thank you very much, Professor. Um, you know, um, you, you indeed uh, laid the ground for uh, uh, looking into the issue of IoTs. I mean, in, when it goes to smart, it should not just be smart in the functioning of itself, but it should be also the R needs to be uh, doing the work of resilience within that. Um, and also the need of the competitive pressure of the market, but also the short term termism that comes with investments uh, from the market in itself. Now, I, 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 I have less than 10 minutes uh, or, or just about 10 minutes. Um, um, you know, uh, and there are a few very interesting questions coming from the floor, and I would definitely love to take that. But before doing it, um, you know, uh, I'm going to put one question to all my panel members. Uh, and in and I would like you to answer that just briefly in, in a minute's time, you know, in 60 seconds, if you could. Um, and the question that I have for all of you is, how do you see the future of infrastructure, uh, digital infrastructure, and how can we ensure that that this future is a resilient one? So it's a it's one question which if we could be responded by all of you um, in a minute's time. Uh, Professor, maybe I'll start um, again with you, uh, just briefly in 60 seconds. Yeah, sure. Uh, this is a tough question, obviously, but uh, in a nutshell, really, I, I believe that we should look at something that the literature is starting to call um, with a, a nice term that is converged resilience. Uh, I mean, converged resilience is an acknowledgement of the fact 
that there is a clear interdependency uh, between the physical and the digital worlds. And um, this understanding should be leveraged in some way in order to build something that is um, a set of lasting and uh, uh, resilient, uh, once again, uh, strategies for uh, improving the overall resilience of the ecosystem that is a, a complex infrastructure that is made of a variegated set of different components. So I will stop it here, but the, the idea of converged resilience is an interesting one. Indeed, indeed. It's, it's very interesting. I take the word converging resilience, uh, combining physical and digital, definitely. Uh, can I move to you, uh, Mr. Lorek, uh, for your input? Yes, just to, com to complete what I said before, uh, to focus on one point, beyond the use of digital technology to protect uh, against cyber attack, I think that digital technology can be used we said, to grow up the res resilience uh, when we in preparing for this time of attack by strengthening the expertise of teams and the ability to manage crisis. When, uh, we, when they occur in three ways, Prevention, it means detection of shortcoming in the organizations, implementation of communication channel uh, between public and private international management, and third, crisis management. It means that crisis reflexes learning and crisis handling. That's all. Yeah, thank you. Um, um, three, three specific criteria, prevention, implementation, and crisis management. Very helpful. Uh, um, Mr. Morrill, can you can I have your um, suggestions in sixty seconds on the same question, please? Sure. We so we we have a saying in public safety: two is one, one is none. So making sure that you have good resiliency in there, look towards those public-private partnerships to create uh, what would be non-traditional areas. Um, and the answer is not always just throwing money at it, but throwing a lot of thought and inventiveness into what's evolving out there and finding creative ways to work together to build those resilient infrastructures. Thanks a lot, thanks a lot. Um, you know, the PPPs are always definitely the center of, of the investment decisions and we need to carefully work with uh, on those different aspects. Thank you very much. Um, I'll move to uh, Ms. Pidikiti with the same questions. Uh, I mean, you in interestingly laid a lot of facts and grounds on what's ha exactly happening in India. Uh, but could you, in a minute, um, put forward uh, to us how does RT Airtel uh, plan to ensure the future of the digital infrastructure to be a resilient one? Yeah. So uh, if if I spoke what what the vulnerabilities etc. So if I see how Bharti Airtel is going to take care of these as a proactive steps based on our own learnings, you know, on this resiliency part. It's a very huge uh, subject, which will would be very, very difficult to summarize in one minute kind of a thing. But however, in the three important domains, you know, how these data centers, what are the best practices, which location it has to be. And if I give one or two examples on that, is the building electrical infrastructure redundant? Is the fiber infrastructure redundant? Is the roots of that fiber is redundant or not? And we also do the proactive coordination with the electricity boards, governments, and also many stakeholders of the diesel. When these are some of the best practices which we have, I just spoke about on the how we maintain the data center. If I extend similar kind of a thing to the cell towers, the connectivity part, the undersea cable, because you you know we also have an undersea cable. Like whenever we get the tsunami kind of a things, how do we manage those capacities? These are all part of our standard operating procedures, you know, which we built and there is no end, but because these are keep on evolving as we keep learning new things when new situation comes, this is how we maintain and ensure the future is going to be intact with these kind of a plans on the disaster management. And Thank also you. with the uh, with the support of the government, you know, on these fiber connectivity part and easy accessibility during these situa disaster situation and power availabilities, we will definitely strengthen further these mitigation plans, which will help the human. Thank you very much, Aruna. I can yeah, I can I agree. It's a very big topic to be summarized in sixty seconds. 
uh, but I do take your highlights, redundancy, coordination, interconnectivity, interdependency, and the role of governance in itself. Um, now, that brings me to uh, uh, my colleague, uh, Vanessa Gray from ITU. Uh, as an international organization, um, what is what do you see or how does ITU see the future of this infrastructure sector and how can we make sure that this is a resilient one? You have your 60 seconds, Vanessa. Thank you. Um, yeah, we've heard a lot about, you know, digital goods and services that they're evolving at, um, at great speed and that we see often that 21st century policymakers and regulators um, are often lagging behind industry innovation. So I would like to focus on, you know, the, the regulation part and the um, need for countries to adapt. Um, at ITU so far, what we have done is we've identified five generations of regulation, um, starting with the first that's more of a command and control approach, um, and now through to the fifth generation that is based on collaboration and harmonized across sectors. And uh, just to give some concrete examples of what is happening in countries that are have now adopted a collaborative fifth generation of regulation, um, they have developed digital strategies, have regulatory sandboxes or test beds for new technologies. These countries have managed to overcome the lack of mechanisms that connect the ICT regulator with other sectors, for example, financial or data protection regulators, um, and they have introduced forward-looking competition policies and data protection laws. Um, we also see that these are countries that go through public consultation to guide regulatory decisions, so really very much a collaborative effort. So really what is key, um, what we see is that we require greater collaboration between policymakers, uh, the regulatory authorities and other stakeholders across the board to effectively harness technological progress and successfully address the challenges of digitalization and for resilient infrastructure. Thank you very much, Vanessa, uh, for that. Um, uh, regulations and collaboration definitely is, is, is the way forward from here. Um, I do have a few questions from the floor, but since I have two minutes left, I won't be in a position to take all of them, but I'm going to take one, uh, one interesting one, and I'm taking it from a perspective that risk and resilience is everybody's business. It's not just the role of just the business of the government or the private sector. It's everybody's business. So I'm taking this question from that perspective. I'm going to leave it open to anybody who feels like uh, responding to it. So we talked about the key risks of digital infrastructure um, and the roles of governments and the private sector. But what is the role of end user in all this? And how do we, what are some of the challenges we see on that front? Is there any of my panel members who is willing to respond to this voluntarily? I can take this one if no okay. one else is going yeah. to take yeah, the floor. Yeah. yeah, no, I, I think that the end user is the, the crucial part of the entire chain. And as usual, this might be even, the, uh, let me say, the weak part. And I, I personally believe, obviously, being an educator, that there is a fundamental role that is played by education. We need to raise the cultural level uh, of people who are using the infrastructure, who are using the internet, who are getting connected every day in their everyday life. And this is part of our mission, I would say. Uh, just to give you an idea, with cybersecurity, I tend to say to, to my students, that, to my colleagues, that we need to evangelize somehow. We need to spread information about what is needed in order to become a, a serious user uh, of the Internet, a user who is aware of the things that they're doing. And I will stop here. Thank you very much, Professor. Um, uh, Thank you. I was I was as Vanessa. You wanted to also come in here very quickly. I think it's fine because uh, Professor, the professor has really covered. I think what I was going to say, digital skills, very important. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, uh, I think we have run out of time. There are some very interesting questions coming from the floor. Maybe uh, with the CDRI uh, colleagues, we should be able to document them and maybe uh, respond back to them in a, in a written FAQ manner. Uh, I mean, for me, uh, it was a pleasure to have you all as the panel. Uh, 
listening to all of you was in, in very thrilling and interesting. Um, in, in to highlight a few takeaways that I had is, you know, if we if we want to increase the resilience of digital infrastructure, investments need to be monitored, and we need to measure their vulnerability, not just the investment but also the asset and the sensitivity, its interdependency, and most most all of the exposure to the risk. Uh, this shift will require um, not just government's role, but also the investor, operators, decision makers. And we need to make sure that the disaster and climate risks are considered in the location, design. Uh, Aruna talked about it on the construction, the operation um, of the plan, but also the future investments that's coming in. And now, equally, infrastructure regulators and operators need to facilitate this transition to be a more in resilient to the development and use of um, not just indicators or frameworks, but also to uh, recognize the patterns of change that are going through with the climate experience coming in. Um, I think I could, you would all agree that um, as we see with the COVID-19 crisis, in a, this is in a way already the first stress test of our interconnected digital infrastructure. The surge of demand for online services as a result of pandemic has shown that digital connectivity and resilience is critical for business continuity. And not just for that, but also to build the resilience of the society and the community in itself. So thank you again for uh, for your time, for speaking to, to us, and also uh, sticking to the time, which was uh, which was already a challenge in this digital environment. Uh, thank you, thank and you have all. a great rest of the day. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Bye-bye. Have a nice thank day. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank -bye. you. Take care. So... Thank you so much, Abhilash and the panel members. We had a very, very interesting discussion with panel members from ITU, India, Japan, Italy, United States of America, and France. And I heard really uh, quotable quotes, including IT plus IT is equal to IT. So from that quote from the Prime Minister of India, which was quoted by the Honorable Minister, to recurring themes like uh, cyber security, internet of things, and regulations lagging behind the changing technology. We had an interesting discuss discussion. I thank all the panel members who uh, accepted the invitation and joined them. With this, we now move on to our next session, which will start at 5.30 or 17.30 India time. But before that, we will uh, announce the results of our Youth for Resilient Infrastructure as a competition. As you are aware that the Youth for Resilient Infrastructure as a competition was announced on 15th of February and the uh, uh, essays were received till 8th of March. In spite of a very, very brief period, we received 143 applications from 34 countries and the jury, a uh, very jury of experts has selected 20 of them from 19 countries as the top top line winners. We are going to announce the winners and the, uh, the essays in the top 20 on our website shortly. You can go to the website and look at the list of winners. I'm sure that youth will engage with disaster resilient infrastructure and they are the future leaders and decision makers. You can also go to our marketplace on the platform and look at various knowledge products and technologies which are being displayed by over 50 uh, solution providers. So you can use this time to do that. See you back at 17.30 for the Urban Resilience session. Thank you.